Well, good evening, everyone. My name is David, and this is Fractal Seven Discussion Group Session Three. We are discussing a little bit of slavery to sonship, few dynamics. I don't know if we're going to necessarily have time in this set, in this next couple of weeks to cover everything that Arthur and Jack Frost and a number of others covered in their teachings on slavery to sonship. However, um, there are some dynamics that I did at, that I did want to cover and from a number of areas, um, including my own stuff, my own thoughts on the topic. Um, and this is actually a pretty good setup for what we're going to be covering in the future, um, notwithstanding the uh, teaching on intimacy, the new spiritual authority, which is a three disc free teaching that Arthur offers on his free section at Sapphire Leadership Group at the SLG.com. Um, there are some other dynamics that I do like to cover um, because I've got a little bit of a different perspective given that I'm not a prophet, but I'm a mercy. Um, so we'll touch on some of these things and some of the things that I have harped on on Facebook land recently. Uh, that have made the rounds and, you know, have made some people a little bit upset. But, you know, that's par for the course. Believers tend to do that from time to time because we're a cantankerous bunch and we have our ideas and revelations. So be that as it may, I would like to open this up in prayer and we will jump in from there. So, Your Majesty, we are grateful for this time. We are grateful for your love and your purposes grateful for what you have given us and what you seek to enshroud us in, which is your tenderness and your kindness, your majesty, your grace. And Lord, there is a passage that says, I believe in Isaiah, where it says all nations will be drawn to your glory. And that pronoun, your, is a reference to the people's glory. And there's another place in the New Testament that parallels that, where, where Yeshua specifically says, you are the light of the world. And sometimes the question gets asked, well, how are we the light of the world if he is the light of the world? Well, one of the easy ways you can actually describe that is a couple of ways. One, because we have been given a new nature after the new birth, there is a portion or a segment of his glory that he puts into us. Uh, he transforms us. He makes us as he is. You know, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, 21, if anyone is in, a, is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. And then he is the light in us, and as a result, we shine forth with his light. And so it says in Isaiah, I believe, that the Gentiles, the nations, the goyim in the Hebrew, which is what refers to non-Jews, are drawn to your glory, the glory that's in the believers, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Um, probably a couple of different ways you can slice that, but either way, we are transformed through the renewing of our minds so that testing, through testing, we can discern what is the will of God. Um, so, Father, we bless you with the glory that you have put into us. We bless you with the nature that you have put into us, with the design that you wish to unpack in each of us, Lord. Lord, you don't want to just leave us in the place of slavery. You don't want to just leave us in a place of just plain obedience, Lord. You want to move us into a place where we're actually working the kingdom and seeing the many different flavors of your kingdom brought forth in both grace and truth. So, Lord, we ask that you be glorified in us as we walk with you and connect with you and fellowship with one another. And through that fellowship, the blood of Christ purifies us from all sin. Thank you, Lord. We ask these things in your name, Yeshua. I mean, Pam was, my, my late wife Pam was driving down the road a few years ago. Having grown up pretty staunch Baptist, she was very much taught this dynamic of obedience backwards and forwards. She was not taught a lot about the Holy Spirit. She was taught about you read the Bible, you do what it says. You read the New Testament, you do what it says. Um, 
She was listening to Arthur a few years ago with this background, and Arthur was talking about obedience, and then Arthur said something that shocked her. Obedience is not the highest calling or the best thing a believer can engage in. It is the goal. It is not the goal of Christian life. Upon hearing this, Pam nearly drove off the road and totaled her car. Nearly. She did make it over to the shoulder, though, where she sat and wept for about half an hour. She came home and related to me this story. She said, the statement didn't make sense, David, but something about it felt right. Then Arthur relayed the point and the higher goal. And she shared that with me, and I want to share that with y'all and for those who will listen in the future, because it impacted her so heavily. We have a number of believers presently in the church that seem to believe the best, highest, and onlyest calling of a believer is to obey. And yes, even though I am an English major and a writer, I like using that form just to emphasize the absurdity of it. So we turn ourselves into the crazy work of serving and obeying all the rules, whether those rules are Torah or you must eat pork and act like Gentiles. And yes, there are um, non-Jews who will actually mandate that people who have become believers who are formerly Orthodox Jews must eat pork and they must act like Gentiles. Then there are other rules. You must celebrate the Feast of Israel. You must celebrate the regular holidays that the rest of the church does. You must do this or that, or you're not allowed to do this, and you're not allowed to do that. Or you must not eat meat sacrificed to idols, or you must do that. Or you must or must not drink alcohol, or you are not allowed to say this set of taboo words, or you must not do this or that. As a result of the, that mindset of obedience we and that servant-hearted Christianity, we get into a rule-oriented faith. And that is, we begin to increasingly live our lives only in relationship to the rules found in the book or on the scroll or on the sheet of paper. That's stuff that's allowable as far as behavior. And consequently, we may run the risk of thinking, because we have kept the rules on the list— then we're righteous. Or we think to ourselves, I messed up on a bunch of these rules, so therefore I'm unrighteous. So as a result, we end up adjudicating ourselves righteous or unrighteous based on that capacity to keep the rules or the incapacity to keep the rules. And while the book and the list, the book being the scriptures, can function as a mirror and a very good mirror at that, and it gives us counsel that is necessary for, you know, as uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 says, you know, it's, it's good for profitable for doctrine, correction, etc. It's God-breathed for a proof so that we can be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Um, while it can function as a mirror, and it does function as a mirror as it should, we cannot have a relationship with a book. Our responsibility is to cultivate a relationship with a person, the truth, the man, Christ Jesus. Too many believers are trying to have a relationship with a book or a piece of paper at the expense of relationship with the man. The truth and the doctrine do make great fences and boundary markers. They make terrible friends, though, unfortunately, because they don't oftentimes talk back to us. There isn't the squish, the tenderheartedness that is needed. There isn't the same warm connection when we read words on the page. We need him to look at it. We need the man to connect with what the book is actually saying. This idea of truth as a book versus truth as a man. And then John 14, 6, where he says, Philip, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then life, when we try to relate to a set of rules, rules alone at the, exp at, the ex at the expense of everything else, it turns into this crazy-making obsession with how many things we are doing right or wrong. We start worrying about our sin count. We start worrying about how holy our lives look based on how many times we have or have not cussed, have or have not drunk, have or have not danced, or have or have not chewed, or have or have not run with the girls that do. 
We move between whether or not we are sinning or embracing sin outright instead of progressing to a larger picture, which is really important in the kingdom. And we get stuck around the obedience-disobedience matrix. We do not move on from that, and obedience alone becomes our only goal. But the problem is obedience alone, apart from relationship, or at the expense or cost of relationship is not the point. Obedience has a role in a place, but it comes in the context of our relationship with him, and we're to cultivate a personal relationship with the Lord. I mean, after all, when we talk to people and witness to them, we we oftentimes come at this dynamic of you have to have a personal relationship with the Lord. Well, are we leading them by starting off with the bait of a personal relationship with the man, only to switch them later on and act as though we only have a relationship with the book? I mean, our responsibility is a relationship. This whole thing starts because of a relationship. It doesn't start because we say a prayer. It starts because there's a desire for that connection, that desire for that warm connection, because we have a whole bunch of people that are lost and dying, and they don't have the warm affection of tenderness that's tied specifically to the Messiah. And as a result of that, life becomes a mess once we understand the purpose, place, and context of obedience. To places that are higher up and further in, everything, including the root of obedience, will bloom. Obedience forms a root, but it is not the point of the kingdom. Sonship and freedom are. In the teaching of the, on the redemptive gift of RJD, ruler, judge, deliverer, which is what I call the ruler, and I can explain that with my blog post later on at some point, Arthur mentions the number line that SLG uses to illustrate the principles and the violations of those principles. And I think it's handy even beyond SLG for our own purposes to look at these number lines and to think of these dynamics of virtues and vices along a number line. Um. <laughs> In the case on the, of the number line for the principle of authority that parallels the redemptive gift of servant, and I'll get to the, the number line for the RJD, you have on one end minus 100, zero, and then plus 100. On that one end, minus 100, you have complete and total justification for why it is wrong, right for everything to be wrong, and you may not at that point even realize that something is wrong. That's called the victim spirit. We think it's right for us to be victimized, right for us to be mistreated. We have been flowing in that victim spirit for so long, and we don't even realize that this is not the way things are supposed to be. And we just chalk it up to, well, that's just my lot in life because I'm a poor old servant for, for the Lord. And we don't realize that that may or may not be what the Lord has for us in that season. And honestly, I don't think he does. I don't think he has us just to have unfiltered pain our entire lives with no victory, no joy, no tenderness, and it, it gets crazy-making. At zero, though, you have no one violating you. Your boundaries work. The Moabite curse, which parallels the servant, is broken. And people generally leave you alone so you can live a peaceful life. Now, we talk about healing and deliverance and exorcism, which is freedom from the demonic. We talk about spiritual warfare. But those things only deliver us up to the point of zero. Beyond that, going past zero, positive numbers on the number line to positive 100, that's what we term in the believing life as growth. And at, with growth, we push for the higher numbers, and as we push for those higher numbers, we also find that there's father-filtered pain that waits for us. It is productive pain. But on the extreme opposite end of the spectrum, as you grow and increase, you grow from bringing God's life-giving authority to bear on your own life to bringing that authority into your friends and family that are open to it, and ultimately bringing and giving the gift to those who do not want it all the way up to nations and people groups that do not want it on the higher ends of this. That's what the principle of authority looks like because God wants to increase the pool of authority that is in the earth. 
the more you walk in principles, the more you earn authority. And the kicker here is not just authority that's given, granted, or endued. The kicker here is authority that is earned. So you work the cause and effect relationships, the principles that are tied up with authority. And as a result, you earn more authority. This earning because of the cause and effect nature of the principles of Scripture and the rest of principles that coalesce around the seven principles is a massive trigger for a whole lot of other stuff that happens that God designed to happen because that's the way he set up reality to work. Could you imagine, for example, a cadre of servants who have the highest return on investment from walking in the principle of authority taking a few years and accruing such authority that they transformed the ruler nation of Iran in a day or a week, it can happen. The principles absolutely do work. Likewise, in the case of sonship bondage, getting to the RJD, the ruler, judge, deliverer, number line, minus 100, zero, plus 100. You have bondage on the one end at minus 100, pure, absolute, abject bondage and exploitation. At zero, you have obedience. And at plus 100, you have complete and total freedom. On the principle of freedom tied to the ruler, you have this dynamic of exploitation. The stronghold, like I said, at the negative numbers, that is embraced, that brings people into bondage or you tolerate it yourself when you're at those negative numbers, and you bring yourself and others into greater bondage and exploitation. A really good example of this in the life of a very carnal ruler is Jeff Bezos of Amazon. He's the perfect example of exploitation. If you look at his um, warehouses, there is so much exploitation. It's just it's nuts. It's crazy. It's enslavement. It is literal modern-day slavery. They're expected to pace themselves, to pick an order select, and I worked as an order selector before in western Massachusetts. I know what this, this life is like, and it is, not a, it is not an easy life. There are quotas to meet, and it is grueling work, and sometimes in these massive warehouses, there is not air conditioning. Um, yeah, and... You know, if you think it's bad up in the Northeast during the summer, just wait till you get down south and you have uh, one of these massive warehouses, such as the one in Charlotte. And if there's no AC and these people are running 10 to 12 hours a day, running eight miles per day on a 10 to 12 hour shift through a million square foot warehouse, I mean, they're sweating bullets. You know, we think we sweat bad. Um, then. You know, just terrible, terrible, servile um, conditions, indentured servitude. So painted the picture well enough of those nasty warehouses. At zero, you have obedience on this number line of freedom. And then you enter greater freedom by greater degrees the further up the positive numbers you go into. And the prequel to earn that authority on that number line of freedom and sonship is greater temptation and greater tests and possibly greater father-filtered pain that's tied to freedom to yourself and those you love. And the reason why I bring up the ruler's number line is because rulers of all the seven redemptive gifts, they make the ultimate fathers. They are the ones that take the imperfect sons that are, that are desperately flawed. And it's amazing what a ruler will do with limited resources, with imperfect people who are not complete, and he will use them to just build stuff. Rulers, unlike exhorters, can work with imperfect people. Exhorters typically need their people to be more fashioned and more of a finished product, and they don't typically work well with those who are very dramatically flawed, whereas the ruler... They can take a, a skeleton crew of very wounded, very damaged people, very imperfect, very flawed people, and they can do such amazing things with them. It's just the nature of the DNA of the ruler. Once you get to understanding the rhythm of obedience, 
at zero and at those at those middle points on the number line, you move into greater capacity not just to obey but to execute. The kingdom is all about execution. It's all about the masculine. It's all about giving. You know, as in the feminine, we receive. In the masculine, we give, which means we build and we fight. That's kingdom work as opposed to bridal work. And to bend your resources, to put together resources, put together systems that are life-giving. And with those systems that are life-giving, you learn how to build and fight, and you teach others how to build and fight. Kingdoms are not built by slaves. They are built by sons who build and fight. Sons who know where the resources are and who can transform the raw materials into finished products. And we grow by degrees in this. Instead of wasting our time with the obedience dynamic, we have the obedience dynamic, that piece in place, more or less. Not that we ever always achieve perfect obedience at every point in time, but, you know, the issues or the struggles with obedience become the exception rather than the rule. Whereas the rule and the focus and the lion's share of our energy gets bent towards building and fighting, extending the kingdom through building and fighting, taking over the territory of the enemy, taking it over for the Lord, cleansing it, setting it free, getting getting it humming along in a healthy fashion with life-giving systems, which is key to the ruler's dynamic. Nehemiah, for example, classic ruler, built the walls of Jerusalem, 2.8 miles long, and according to some measurements, 50 feet high, 15 meters high. In 52 days, he built three miles of wall while he was fighting. Sons may have occasional bouts of struggling with obedience, but it comes, it becomes the exception to the rule, or rule rather than the usual thing. Their aim is not towards basic obedience, but their aim is beyond obedience, towards finding what the Father and the King has designed for them, where what he is doing, where he is at work, and partnering with him according to their own unique design. Before they can partner, they have to be able to trust that he is a good father, which means a series of encounters that transform and move the heart of a servant into the heart of a son, which means they have to encounter the heart of God the Father himself. In order to become a father, you have to have a father. And there is one perfect father who does not lack resources with which to father us. We talk about spiritual fathers all the time, frequently in the charismatic movement. We talk about apostolic covering or apostolic fathering or whatever the case and frequently we talk about a spiritual father and who is your covering, and we totally miss the resource that we have in God the Father, who is completely capable of fathering us, if we'll let him. You know, um, I had no father growing up. Uh, my father abandoned me. I had two abusive stepfathers over the course of a number of years. And as a result of that, the Lord himself fathered me. And I had a whole bunch of people who said, well, you're supposed to have a spiritual father or else. Or else what? I have the Lord. No, you need to have somebody else. No, I had God the Father helping me. I mean, are we are we really going to treat him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Are we really going to act like we, we worship a trinity, trinity and unity, unity and trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Are we just going to say, okay, he's just kind of a stand-in sort of kind of occasionally without intervention, and we need somebody with flesh on? And, you know, I'm not discounting the fact that the Lord puts the fatherless in families, but I am saying sometimes the family he puts us into is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When all else fails, they don't. When all else fails, they will work with us. When all else fails they will not fail. When all else fails, they will not deny us, for he cannot deny himself. That's 2 Timothy 1. I mean, he, he must remain faithful. He cannot deny himself. You know, I mean, are we really going to treat him as father, or are we just going to say, I need a substitute? I need someone else. I'm going to keep driving until I find it. You know, after a point, the Lord had finally said when I was hunting for spiritual fathers for 
from ages 18 to like 25, 35, he said, you had enough? I told you I would father you. I told you I would be your father. Do you not remember what I told you? I was like, yes, Lord. And the kicker is, if we don't have one, he will be one. And he's more than willing and more than capable. But the question is, do we have the capacity and the willingness to take him on, even when the culture and the church culture tells us that we need someone else? Who better than God the Father to father us? But it also means pushing back against this Ishmaelite apostolic nonsense that tells us you need a spiritual father and I'll be your covering and you need to run everything by what I tell you. Um, no, I need to do what the Lord says. I need to hear what he's saying, encounter his heart, be melted in my heart because of what he has done for me, and move deeply into sonship with him, which has happened for me. It's so radically different to have that mindset of when you don't have a father, God can be your father. You know, if we recite the creed, you know, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, I believe in God the Father Almighty, you know, of all that is seen and unseen, do we really believe in God as Father? Or are we just kind of like reciting creed, rattling it off, and, and reciting the biblical text without having a relationship with the man who is Father? I mean, we get the choice here. We get to settle for something lesser. Oh, we get to go with the one who is. And deep in that personal relationship, there are oceans of his fathering love for us. And there are ways he understands us that even our earthly fathers can't possibly. Because he's the one who knit us together in our mother's womb. And he's the one who designed our frame and decided what threads he was going to use what thread size, what coarseness, what place he was going to use everything, whether he was going to put burlap or cashmere in this place, whether he was going to use, you know, denim in one place and silk in another, or whatever the case. He knows our design. He knows how we are made. And my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Another shepherd they will not follow. The question is, are we willing to embrace that? Or are we just treating him as a stand-in until we get to, you know, begging somebody to be our daddy? We never have to beg him. He's always willing to run to us. And before we can partner, we have to be able to trust that he is a good father, which means we have to encounter his heart, mono a mono. And it doesn't just come merely through a mediary. There is no mediator between God and men except the one man, Christ Jesus, and that is Hebrews. He is the mediator. And he makes us and brings us to a place where we can encounter the heart of God the Father who is deeply loving to us. And the reality of Deuteronomy 6.5, which is the heart of all the scriptures. The heart of the scriptures is the Old Testament. The heart of the Old Testament is Deuteronomy. The heart of Deuteronomy is Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, Adonai Echad, which parallel which, the first of the ten compound names of Adonai, which parallels God the Father. The Lord our God, the Lord who is one, he is not disintegrated, he is not divided, he is not in pieces. He is completely whole in a unity with himself, and he is not a drunkard or an alcoholic. He is not a drug addict. He is not absent. He is not abusive. And if he commands us 
the first of three instances in the scripture where it says, which is the Hebrew word that is a command translated as you shall love. You shall love the Lord your God. And if he commanded us to love him, if he instructed us to love him or told us that we should love him, the reality is we love him because he first loved us. Meaning that the the framework, the power lines for the love to flow between us were already there. They were built by him because he loved us first. He's not telling us to do something that he is not already doing. If he's commanding us to love him, it's because he already loves us deeply and passionately and zealously with a fire and a tenderness and a warmth and an affection and a compassion. He's already got the one way of his love flowing to us. He's waiting for the reciprocation. He waits with anxious expectation. So this, this command to obedience is not just a command to obedience. It's, a, it's an invitation to sonship. The first time he reveals himself to a pagan ruler in Exodus 4, he says, um, Israel is my firstborn. Let go of my firstborn, and if you don't, Pharaoh, I will kill your firstborn. So his first revelation to a pagan ruler is as father. And before God was creator, he was father. The first revelation of God is as father because Jesus Christ was eternally begotten of God. He was eternally begotten of the father. There was never a time when God was not father. There was a time when he was not creator. Before he was creator, he was father. Before he made, Yeshua was begotten, full of grace and truth. The Yahid of the Father, the Son whom you dearly loved. And then he says in Genesis 22, Abram, and Abraham says, Here I am. And he said, Take your Yahid, Yitzhak, your firstborn son whom you love, and go to one of the hills of Moriah. And there offer him as a holocaust offering, as a burnt offering on one of the hills where I shall tell you. I want to thread that one together. I want to bring the, the passage from Genesis 2 where the Lord says, it is not good for man to be alone. And if Christ was crucified from the foundations of the world, then that means that the crucifixion where he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me when he was alone? That means in Genesis 2, he knew from the cross what it was like to be alone, which is why he could say, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him... Uh, a battle buddy, a foxhole buddy. I will make him an answer suitable for him. Because he knows what it's like to be alone. He deeply knows what that's like. Which is why he could speak to Abraham and say, take your son whom you love. Because Christ was crucified from the foundations of the world. Being the I am, every moment for him was the present. And he was able to look at the end from the beginning. He was able to look past, present, and future into what was going to happen to his only begotten son. Because it was like it had already happened. And he knew what was going to happen going forward in the process of time. And with that loving father's heart, he said, take your son, your Yaqid, that you love, and go to one of the hills of Moriah, and there offer him. So it's not just a, 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 a matter of command. It's a matter of invitation. It's a matter of tenderness and love and sonship and affection. Not obedience. Not merely obedience. Before we can partner, we have to be able to trust he is a good father, which means we have to have that revelation 
of what the heart of the Father is like. A series of encounters. And then, following that, when we have encountered his loving heart, then comes the season of abiding, John 15, and receiving from him. And as a result, what Jack Frost of Shiloh Place said, we receive from his heart, we experience his embrace and his love, and we want to give it away to the next person that we meet. So we have this dynamic of receiving the revelation of his love, which is what Shiloh Place, that whole revelation of the Father Heart that gave birth the Toronto Blessing of 1994, at what is now known as Catch the Fire Church, but used to be known as Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship, a Toronto vineyard, John Arnott and Carol Arnott. That was what the first revival was all about in the 1990s. Either way, you learn how deeply loving the Father is. And from that love and abiding, you can then give out of the storehouse of love as well. And then as you learn from him, you know, take my yoke upon me and learn uh, upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Matthew 11:27 through 30. As he teaches you how to build in freedom, because your heart has been liberated, because it knows and can trust in the tender and affectionate heart of a loving father. It's not just accepting, expecting abject obedience, but wants to partner with you. And he had that partnership and that desire and that same covenant from Genesis to Revelation. It was never about us becoming slaves, even if that is what Paul wrote about himself in his letters when he said, Paul, a doulos of Christ Jesus. That was Paul's own self self uh, reflection on his own, on his, uh, his own image. It was never prescriptive for us. It was never about us becoming slaves. It was always about us becoming sons and friends. Creation is not groaning for the manifestations of the slaves of God who perfectly obey. Creation is manifest groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. And that sonship is only released when we receive a revelation of God the Father's loving heart for us. I'll tell you what, that will liberate you to another level. And I'm not saying we completely dismiss the obedience and doing what the Lord tells us to do. You know, if you know if you know one thing about me, you know I specialize in the redemptive gift of teacher and the principle of responsibility and the Philistine curse, which is doing everything except the one thing the Lord tells you to do. And that's what the religious spirit is above everything else. The religious spirit is all about doing everything except the one thing the Lord told you to do. That is the simplest definition of the religious spirit I have. And as a result of us doing everything except the one thing we're supposed to do, and us neglecting the one thing, Jesus, that we need, we constantly end up with the Philistine curse of missing the one thing that will round out the package and make it complete. So I am not saying we just completely dismiss obedience, but what I am saying is it is a low ball goal for us when there are higher and deeper and further dimensions of kingdom that he wants to release in this earth. You know, go beyond what Arthur is doing into, and into what the Lord wants David to do, or Bethany to do, or Cheryl to do, or anyone else. You know, go beyond the revelation that other people have received into the revelation he wants to give you that's original. Deeper, 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 more. Things that have not yet been unpacked. No eye has seen. We're not going to run out. You know, add add to what the king tell you know what the king gives you your unique piece. You can add it to the pool of resources that he's given to other people. I didn't say add to scripture. 
hence I take away from scripture. Your unique piece that's tied to your design adds to the pool of tools that the kingdom already has access to. The, the recombination of, of resources and tools into new combinations. This is the project the Lord has given you or me or whomever. Just a little bit different. And that is my piece and my story, so I'm sticking to it. Is there anything that anybody would like to ask or make an observation about or thoughts? Love to hear at this point, if anything. Can you hear me, David? I can, Bethany. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was going to say on the obedience part, for me especially too, it's, it's almost a training training ground. So it's more of what if you, when you get in the habit of obeying, it becomes second nature so that you're not fighting between your will and what he's asking you to do. And it, it becomes almost a surrender so that when he says that you do it, that's it. And I know for me personally, that that was the struggle. And then learning to trust. I know that's what he said. I'm going to do it. But what's next? And so that's kind of how I've looked at it. Like, because I grew up, quote unquote, in the age of obedience. So where they, my parents were teaching me to obey, but it was like, okay, well, there's got to be more. So I just want to share that. Makes a whole lot of sense, Bethany. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we we there we will have those seasons where we are absolutely going to wrestle with. Uh, am I going to do what he says? Um, most recently, I had to deal with a situation with a friend where the Lord's where I had did not obey, and the Lord was none too happy with me because of my disobedience, and it ended up costing me dearly in the area of a very precious friendship. Oh. Yeah, I mean, and I think like it only takes a few times of that happening to where it's like it's not it's not worth just doing what he says. It's almost like adolescence when they're battling between like they want their freedom, but you're trying to teach them how to use their freedom, basically the ruler, you know. And so I think that that's really significant because it, it's like I'm not I'm not going to risk anymore because I see now if I just do what he asked me to do, he's got my best interest. He's got my back. He knows every need that I have. Why wouldn't I like, and then it becomes an act of love because it turns into those intimacy moments and you can feel like literally feel the love. And then it's not even about obeying anymore. It's just out of love. Bingo. Yep. 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 And I guess speaking from the fathering aspect from my two daughters, you know, because I was struggling when your dad and I were not together. And I was like, I can't be mom and dad. And the Lord was like, you don't have to. I'll do it. Just let me do it. And I was like, what? Because at the time I was like, what? What? And I did. I stepped back and was like, okay. And I remember seeing him put his hand down and like saying, trust me. And I grabbed it, and I will never forget where I was and the whole moment. It just, woo, yeah. Sorry I'm breathing so heavy. I'm walking, but, yeah, wow. Motion anointing got a motion. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and I'm praying as you're talking, and it just, especially the whole Nehemiah aspect, and, yeah. So, keep on, keep it on. I have to say, I'm digging the bird song. Oh, can you hear it? <laughs> I absolutely can hear it. It's wonderful. Right. I can Wait, hear some Carolina pictures. Wrens and some Cardinals and some oh, wow. American Robins. Yeah. 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 There's another one. That's amazing. But I've been taking wildlife pictures. I was just looking at two baby armadillos I came across as I was walking. I was like, oh, wow. So I was looking at those and I took, I found a frog and then some, some beautiful flowers, which is like, the rain just right there on the pedals. So yeah, 
It's great, it's great stuff. Cheryl, did you have any thoughts? Hold on one second. Oh. Hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I okay. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to ask. On um, you said Adonai, and you said a Hebrew word after that. What was that word? Adonai Echad. E C C H A D is how I would go go with it. Actually, what e -C -C I'll do is E C E C C A D Echad. Okay. So it basically right. means the Lord who is one or the or the one Lord. Okay. And then firstborn son, what was the Hebrew word for that? Which one say that again? Oh, the first firstborn son, son. The one who you the one whom you love, yeah. Yahid. Y A C H I D. Y A C H I D. Okay, thank you. Yahid. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's well, all I needed. Yeah. And it's interesting because that is the, if I remember correctly, in all of the Tanakh, which is the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketuvim, the, the law, the, the, the writings, and the prophets, that is the only time that word is used in the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament. Um, I think every other time there, that, that the word is used, it's another word that's used for son. But there's something that's different and unique about what about Isaac's position. And it's fascinating to me that you have you have the counterfeit that the enemy brings in when the Lord tries to bring his authentic. And that's best seen in the parallel between Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac is so deeply loved, and Ishmael, well, there were a number of issues there. Um and it happens with, you know, fathering as well. The Lord brings in these count. The, the Lord brings in his authentic, the apostolic, and then there's this counterfeit Ishmaelite that's been brewing for decades. And there's this dynamic of uh, like when you look at the true apostolic, what is it? It's a fathering heart that that is compassionate and not just controlling. And you repeatedly see in a lot of the counterfeit stuff, there's this element of control that that is very, very damaging. Um, so I like the 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 picture of what the Lord is doing with Isaac. Um, and I think it has a whole lot more application for a whole lot more in the church than we give thought to. I think there's something to it. Yeah, I agree. So, all right. Well, those are my thoughts, and I know it is. I know we're only forty-eight minutes in, but I am perfectly fine with us putting a button in it at this point in time. And um, I'll go ahead and pray. So, Father, I thank you so much for the the expression of your heart. I thank you so much for your love and the way you want to constantly show us how deeply and how widely and how broadly you love us. And Lord, it's not just about whether or not we fit a predetermined image, Lord. It's whether or not we know how deeply you love us in the way you designed us. Father, I know we're at the end of a window of reconciliation, and we are also at the end of the month of June where there has been a whole lot of stuff stirred up in the spirit, for better or worse. And I ask that you would show us how to respond to each of those things as sons and to bring your love to a community that is deeply needing it. Deeply needing to know that there is a loving father. Even if many of them may not have had it. And Lord, I, I, I am speaking of the quote bag community, the LGBT community. 
And I ask that you would bring your fathering spirit among that community so that they know you even as they are fully known, even as they are writhing and struggling with who they are in terms of identity, Lord, that you would root their identity in the love of God and you would show them how deeply you love them so you can break whatever junk has wounded them or hurt them, Lord. I ask that you administer your truth in this hour and that we would have skill and understanding and wisdom for working with them. Grant us your fathering skill. Grant us the understanding of what it looks like to walk as sons with the warm heart of our Heavenly Father. Be with us, Lord, as we are with you in this context and in this season. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In the name of Yeshua, I ask these things. I mean, well, y'all be at peace, and we will gather together next week. Um, I think there are a couple of other dynamic. There are some other dynamics I want to begin pulling out of the slavery to shunship stuff that Arthur has has mentioned, um, and to kind of take some some roads through that uh, that uh, video series. Um, but we're also going to be dealing with a couple of other topics as well in the next few weeks, as I've already stated in some of the class description and whatnot. So uh, look forward to talking with that about that with y'all and interacting. Uh, be blessed. Love you guys. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.